Thank, thank you, everyone, for coming in. Uh, my name is Brett Steele. I'm the director of the AA School. And on behalf of the, the school, and in fact, 3,000 members worldwide, let me just say thank you for coming in this evening. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be able to, to hold this evening here, not far around the corner from where Monica and her team of brilliant collaborators changed architecture as we know it uh, a few short decades ago and for many years before and after. Um, um, she is someone that you all know well. I certainly don't need to introduce her to you here. In fact, we have a wonderful roster of collaborators, friends, partners uh, to speak about her incredible achievements, indeed her vision of what architecture could be, not just in this country, but worldwide. So I'm going to leave that task very much to the guests that will follow this welcome. Um, let me just say, to, one way to think of the context of tonight's event certainly is in that parlor game that many architects and their historians play to try and map the influence that we think of as the forces that have shaped architecture as we know it. I think the game is often played around single names, single projects, unique theories that somehow can be seen to be the force to shape the way other architects work. I think in the context of tonight's event especially, one way to map influence in the 20th century in architecture would be to point to the technology of the printed page and indeed the printed magazine page, which comes of age in the latter part of the 19th century and alongside infrastructures like railroads and other means of distribution creates a vehicle through which architectural ideas could travel at speeds and distances that have simply never been negotiated before. That form of the architectural magazine as we know it, in my eyes, takes a few decades to find, it, to find its masters, who are known as architectural editors. And surely Monica sits at the very top of that list of editors who shaped a field of knowledge and a form of practice. And that's what we're here to celebrate tonight. And I will pass over to Peter Murray, who will introduce the evening's proceedings in the comments that will come afterwards. Peter, thank you everyone for coming in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brett. And also I'd like to thank Nicola Quinn, who's put an awful lot of work into getting everyone together, tracking down people in an amazing way. Um, so I'm, I'm really... Uh, MC for the evening, having been uh, technical editor at AD uh, in the early 70s and then continuing on to help Monica digitize her archive collection and uh, create Pigeon Digital, which still uh, continues on her work today. So we have various people to talk to you this evening and I shall start with a brief introduction to Monica. For those of you, you who don't know, uh, Monica was born Monica Lehman in Chile in 1913. Her father was French and was chairman of a copper mining company. Her mother was Scottish and insisted the family return to the UK for the children to complete their education. So in 1929, the family arrived in London. Um, soon afterwards, Monica enrolled at the Bartlett but uh, Sir Albert Richardson, who was professor at the time, deemed that interior design rather than architecture was a more appropriate course for a woman. So she did two years of uh, <coughs> interior design. Uh, her contemporaries on the architecture course were uh, Hugh Casson, Richard Seifert, and a young student called Raymond Pigeon. Uh, Monica and Raymond married in 1936. They had a daughter, Annabel, Annabel Donat, and Carl, who are here tonight, I'm glad to say. Monica joined uh, what was then called Architectural Design and Construction in 1941 to assist uh, Tony, or F.E. Tandro, as he was uh, put in the uh, heading on the magazine, uh, who was the then editor of that magazine. Uh, architectural Design and Construction had been started in the early 30s by the Standard Catalogue Company, who also owned the Whitefriars Press in Tunbridge, which was a high-quality letterpress printing outfit 
And uh, I think they thought that architectural design was a jolly good way of getting regular orders, uh, uh, printing orders, into, into the factory. And the quality of uh, their printing uh, was uh, uh, central to uh, a number of people joining the magazine later. Um, Effie Tandro was uh, very much an expert in construction, and he was involved in the war effort in the Ministry of Works, and a lot of AD during the war covered the design of bomb shelters and the repair of damaged buildings. And in 1946, uh, Tandro left for Sydney uh, uh, and, uh, to become Dean of Architecture and Building and Town Planning at the University of New South Wales. And Monica, who had been helping him uh, since 1941 as assistant editor, was then upgraded to editor. And uh, it's understood that uh, Tandro believed that uh, Monica was a fully qualified architect um, when he made, uh, got her the job to follow him, and it was something that she never disabused him of. Um, and in order to support this, um, the all-female team of AD at the time, um, the assistant editor then was Barbara Randall, an advisory board of male architects was created to give advertisers greater confidence in the content. Uh, Dennis Lasden, Erno Goldfinger and Gontran Golden were on the board, and technical topics were covered by a young student, Dargan Bullivant, who uh, is here tonight. And uh, Dargan said the other day that one of the advantages of going to AD, as I said, that it was a well-printed magazine, and that uh, all his drawings reproduced much better there than they did on the cheap paper the other magazines were then printed off. That was because of the connections uh, Whitefriars Press had, I guess, with the paper industry. Uh, but if you speak to Dargan, he'll give you a copy of um, his drawings of the Skylon, and you could actually build the Skylon today from Dargan's drawings. Um, in those years, also, Monica was closely involved in the promulgation of the modern movement. She attended the founding meeting of the Union uh, of International Architects. Uh, she also went to the first post-war meetings of SIAM and was an active member of Mars. And I remember finding a photograph in the AJ of uh, uh, the Bridgewater SIAM conference, which was held there in 1947. And in, 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 the, in the middle of uh, 60 or so uh, male architects, very striking, <coughs> dark-haired, beautiful woman, um, Dargan talked about her always wearing bright red lipstick, but seeing Monica, very proud, powerful, amongst this group of, uh, of alpha males, uh, summed up for me her strength and determination to succeed in what then was uh, totally a man's world. In the early 1950s, Theo Crosby became AD's technical editor. Um, Theo, at the same time, was, uh, had curated the uh, This Is Tomorrow exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery bringing together the work of artists and architects like Palozzi, Hamilton, Collins, Injun Wilson, and the Smithsons. And uh, Theo began to give AD a real voice. Uh, Monica was a member of the organizing committee of the UIA conference in 1961 in London, and it was there that she met uh, Bucky Fuller, who was in London to launch the World Design Science Decade that year, which was a uh, far-sighted program to uh, control the depletion of the world's resources, something that uh, uh, AD addressed uh, in the following years and has become very significant in more recent times. And in 1962, uh, Theo handed over the uh, technical editorship to uh, Ken Frampton, who I'm glad to say is here tonight and will continue the story. Ken, over to you. Good evening. Well, I've written this because, um, it's a cover by me, by the way. Anyway, I've written this because I think it's for the best. Time, memory, death. One hardly knows which of these three are more difficult to contend with, although it is the relentless passage of time, surely ever escalating, that is among the more uncanny experiences which one has to find a way somehow to come to terms with as the years advance. Unlike my grandfather, who would never tire of reminding me when I was a child that it seems only yesterday, 
I can hardly say that of the time when I was privileged to work closely with Monica in the editorial offices of architectural design at the beginning of what used to be called the swinging 60s. Now this occasion in her honor has presented me with the opportunity to acknowledge my debt to Monica who from the very first moment of our collaboration gave me all the space I needed to inflect the line of the magazine. Overnight she transferred to me all the confidence which she had previously bestowed on Theo Crosby during the eight inaugural years that he, he had served as technical editor of AD. So while she was a demanding colleague who knew above all else how to maintain a professional editorial standard and still get the magazine out on time, she never cramped my style in any way. And although we inevitably had our disagreements, which were invariably short, sharp, tempestuous, she once characterized me as the most neurotic thing she'd ever met. <laughs> Once the smoke had cleared, it was all forgotten and we moved on in unison, if not exactly in harmony, to advance the cause of the number of the journal that we happened to be, have in hand. While well, we gave the unfolding sequence a somewhat different cast from what it had assumed under Theo. When I look back at these two and a half years, I have to say they were among the richest and most rewarding years of my life, so much so that there are many things about this seemingly golden period for me that in retrospect I cannot quite believe, not the least of them being that we jointly edited this monthly magazine while only working in the afternoons from two to seven, <laughs> five days a week with ostensibly, ostensibly full-time secretary who came in around 10 and an editorial assistant who came in at the same time or even later the long-suffering John Brooks, at my, during my time at least, who has since, I believe, become uh, a renowned figure in the British land, landscape prof profession. Monica, as I need, I think, not remind uh, too many people here, was possessed of prodigious amount of energy, which fortunately enough, I was able to match at the time, and together we had a, a lively experience, often meeting for lunch in fancy Soho restaurants at the start of our day in the cause of entertaining some visiting dignitary, or alternatively, being entertained to lunch by solicitous architects, such as, I recall, Brian Henderson and David Alford of YRM, who photo mur were an unrivaled witty partnership who reduced both Monica and myself to tears of laughter in some restaurant near the Inns of Court whose name I have forgotten. Monica was an exceptionally gregarious and social being who liked nothing better at the end of the day when we had finished work than going to an exhibition opening, which we invariably did at least once a week, or alternatively, we took some visiting star architect out to dinner and sometimes even to the theater, such as Lucio Costa and his beautiful enigmatic daughter with whom I promptly fell in love for a brief second, Bucky Fuller and his wife, no love there, and Jonah Friedman, uh, uh, <laughs> I had a lot of love for you, Jonah Friedman, and uh, Jaime Bayalta, and so on. On other more normative occasions, Monica whisked herself off in her mini to the tranquility of St. Anne's Close, Highgate, where she lived, I believe, for some 60 years in what is still, for me, one of the most successful assemblies of semi-detached houses I have seen with shallow monopitch tiled roofs, beautifully landscaped with remarkably uh, uh, cool continental steel frame picture windows divided into squares, a diminutive Walter Siegel masterpiece from another time, which was also in effect a pioneering housing association, I believe, uh, that shortly after the end of the First World, Second World War, Monica had the presence to in, prescience to invest in. I could not have foreseen when I was at AD that later, long after Monica had finally retired from all her editorial adventures, that I would visit her there as a geriatric father with my young wife and, and then young son, already, I am sorry to say, some 20 years ago. On these occasions, she welcomed all three or two of us, as the case may be, as though in some unaccountable way I was a distant prodigal member of her own family. This was one of the paradoxical sides of Monica inasmuch as this measure of familiarity was an integral side of her loyalty, while at the same time she remained temperamentally 
somewhat unsuited to the conventional constraints of family life. Part of the fertile two and a half years that I spent at AD was a study trip that I took with Monica in Germany on behalf of the magazine. We were well supported at that time, I think. When we experienced one memorable encounter after another, including a visit to Lisa Lotte Ungers in the beautiful brutalist brick and concrete house that Matthias, Matthias Ungers had designed and realized for his family in Cologne. Not to mention other encounters which would exercise a particular influence on me, above all perhaps the meeting with Thomas Maldonado and Claude Schneid in the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm, or say our encounter in Berlin with Julius Posner, who wearing a flat hat had just repatriated himself from years in Africa to take up a professorial position at the TU in Berlin. Or let's say even more a chronologically tea with Hans Scharoun and his Lottie Lenya wife in one of his own housing schemes. Most memorable of all, perhaps, was Georg Heinrichs, who had once worked for YRM and was now a partner of the ascendant Berlin practice of Heinrichs Muller Duttmann, who drove us in his vintage Citroen at top speed from one notorious Berlin monument to the next, from Mendelssohn's Metal Union building to Walter Luckhart's house with horizontal tiles built after the Second World War saying each time, Bitteschön, Dankeschön, Auf Wiedersehen, each momentary picture opportunity stop en route as he drove us back to Tempelhof Airport. Back in London, I have in my memory one particular evening uh, dr for drinks at the prospect of Whitney with the very chastened Vincent Scully immediately after Kennedy's assassination. And later on, an episode with Bucky Fuller who arrived at the AD offices totally shaken after giving, giving one of his interminable lectures at the Bartlett, where he had been openly attacked by a student for his anti-nuclear dome over Manhattan, and amongst other proposals. His first thought, as he told us, was that the dear boy was deranged, but afterwards, as he put it, I realized that he just didn't like me. And later, after we'd taken him and his wife out to dinner on the steps of White's Hotel, he told us, I do not know what the dear Lord is trying to tell me by this. It really got on his nerves. <laughs> so you see, I am totally indebted to Monica for all that she exposed me to on a weekly basis, for all the interesting and illustrious people I would never have met had it not been for her and for Theo, for it's Theo who picked me out for some reason from all the other people who could easily have followed him uh, just as competently. For the scene of a magazine which they had jointly created and which I inherited and contributed to, figures such as uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi uh, in Milan, Jack Coyer of Gillespie Kitten Coyer in Glasgow, aided and abetted by Macmillan and Mextine, Le Corbusier in 35 Rue de Sèvres when we published Brie en Forêt. Uh, in the interim, I was able to advance the critical stance of the magazine with a line of authors who uh, had not hitherto been published in that journal, including Joseph Rickworth, Alan Cahoon, Neve Brown, and Gunter Nitschke. I was able to shape the journal into a magazine of discourse to focus on special issues that in, in one way or another began to feature architects who were both known and unknown, uh, such as Aris Constantinidis and um, Mangiarotti and Morissuti. Uh, hence, we were the first magazine in English to revive an interest in the work of Giuseppe Tirani. We also uh, were the first to publish Constant Neuwenhus's influential essay, New Babylon, in English in 1960. Like Theo, I had my hands full from the covers of the magazine to editing copy to writing criticism. None of this would have been possible without Monica's support and patronage. And I would also have to admit, in closing this brief homage, that however short our collaboration may have been, I shall remain indebted to her for the rest of my life. Now, our, our next speaker is uh, Michael Manser, and he was the uh, freelance news editor of AD in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Michael. Well, uh, Kenneth hasn't left me much to say. Um, so I'll tell you how I got appointed to this job. In 1961, I'd had a bad experience with journalism 
because I'd spent a year in Jamaica and the Architects Journal had asked me to write a view of Jamaica, anonymously of course, which is a mistake no journalist should ever make, which was published on a Wednesday, the telegram came on Thursday and I was on a boat coming home on Tuesday. So that's the power, power of print. So then I was writing for a, a woman's magazine, a monthly article, I was called their consultant architect, and I needed a picture, and I knew Monica had it. So I phoned up Monica's office, and I wasn't sure who I spoke to, and I asked if they had this particular picture of this particular building. And they said they had, and <coughs> I said, could I borrow it? And they said I could. So it was arranged I'd go and pick it up. On the way, in my Morris Minor, 1000, a coal lorry hit me in the back in Piccadilly Circus. And the impact didn't do much damage, but it flattened one of the tyres. And I've never been much of a mechanic or enthusiast. And so in Piccadilly Circus, I had to mend the tyre, change the wheel, partly helped and partly hassled by a policeman. And I got absolutely filthy. And so I arrived at Monica's office really covered in oil and filth and uh, announced myself from the door and said, could I come in? And this voice, which was Monica, says, yes, just that. So I came in and surveyed the scene and tentatively said, um, my name's Matt, I've come to collect a photograph. And she said, I know. And then she turned around and looked at me and said, good gracious, what have you been doing? <laughs> so I borrowed the bathroom for some time and then I came and they gave me a box of photographs and I, I found what I wanted and um, was about to go and said to Monica, do you ever take freelance contributions? And she said, no, no, we never do that. So I said, well, bye-bye. And as I got to the door, she said, I couldn't see her back then, because was, I was around the back of the door, do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> so I came back around the door and said, uh, what sort of a job? Full time? She said, no, part time. What should I do? News editor. I said, what? Me? She said, yes. Do you want to do it? So I said, yes. <laughs> so it's arranged I'd come back clean and learn how to do it. And I got £27 a month. And I would do half the work in the office in the afternoons and half the work in my own time. And this went on for some time and it was an amazing experience because we sat at a huge table and Theo sat opposite me and um, Monica sat there and I was very much daunted by this sort of, these, um, this amazing, because I was only 31 and these were big names and this amazing magazine to be associated with. And Theo used to sit opposite me with a mouthful of pins with one hand pinning the magazine together, with the other hand sketching, and between whiles he had the phone stuck like this and talking to people, which I thought was a pretty impressive endeavour. And Monica was sitting here, and she was talking to Theo, who was also talking to her between whiles, and then every time the phone rang, she'd pick it up and speak fluently in a different language. I mean, it was just amazing. Um, they were an incredibly clever pair and Monica was very much in the lead and Theo also used to design the covers and I've been flicking through the covers today I've been flicking through old ladies and there's nothing like it now and as Ken said extraordinarily exotic architects from all over the world used to wander through the office I'd be introduced to them they didn't know who they was I knew who they was and each time I was thrilled to bits. Then, that was in March 61 I started. Suddenly, without warning, she said in October, we've been thinking, we'd like you to do a column like that in The Spectator called The Month in Britain, once a month. So I said, all right. <laughs> and that involved seeing most of the newspapers, all the magazines, and skimming through them. And the first time it took me a week to skim through and get the material and a week to write it. By 18 months, I was able to do the whole lot in one evening. And it was the most enjoyable bit of journalism I've ever done. And I learned how to irritate Monica because I discovered 
that have, she had the most fierce face you can imagine of anybody when she was irritated. And then you look round again and she was this benevolent, big smile, wore soft expression. Anyway, the way I used to fix her was to hold up a picture of a building and say, do you think we ought to publish this, Monica? And she would always say, who did it? And I would say, no, I, I don't know who did it. Do you think we ought to publish it? And she'd say again, and this would go on, and eventually she'd get really cross with me and say, tell me who it is or put it away. She would never commit herself till she knew who the architect was, which I thought was interesting, because she, she was m incredibly sure, and she was, she was really quite remarkable in every way. And during that time, I was also um, building myself a house I designed, and she were asked about it once, she showed no interest at all. But in March of 62, she published it. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Which, of course, I was thrilled to bits about. Um, and apart from Theo, and then Ken came after that, he was much quieter. <laughs> and used to sit there quietly. And always when you came in, you were moaning about some project you have with 300 houses and you've just been to the site meeting. Well, how many was it? Maybe that was... 48. 48, well, that's quite a lot. And you, did, you weren't satisfied with the building. Um, and also, I once mentioned to Monica that I had worked in an office for Raymond Pigeon, her husband. And she said, yes, terrible hypochondriac. <laughs> And then I, I then remember that as an office boy, I was continually being sent out to get tablets. <coughs> uh, so I owe a hell of a lot to Monica. She taught me so much about journalism. Um, and for a while, I actually contemplated being a journalist because I then got the job of being um, architectural correspondent of The Observer, which was great fun. Um, but I think the one thing that c comes in front of my eyes when I think about Monica was A, how fierce she was and how terrified I was at first, and B, in a moment, she had a totally different, open, happy, smiling, generous face. And uh, that went on to the end. I, I was always a little bit frightened of her. Uh, next up is Sam Webb, uh, neighbour and contributor. Well, I don't know what you did wrong, but I thought she was wonderful. You must have, yeah. Now, I met Monica in 1961 when I moved into St Anne's Close as a fourth-year student, not here, but from the Northern Poly, which cost £17 a, a year, uh, to study, and if you lived in Middlesex County Council, you got it for free, except my dad told me he paid for it, but he didn't. When I told him about this place, he had a fit over the fees. Anyway, last time I came here was a sad occasion, because Martin Pauli had died. Martin was one of Monica's contributors, and... Uh, so, I moved into St Anne's Close. I'd heard of Monica. I knew a man called George Fairweather, who'd, uh, uh, whose daughter's flat I rented, two bedrooms, garden, three pounds a week. And um, there were all these other people who lived slightly out of view in these beautiful houses designed by Walter Siegel, who, those of you who remember him, he was about five feet tall, like George Fairweather. And there was a row of houses at the back, and Michael Grice lived at one end, the West End, and at the other end was Michael Cook Yarborough, who were both partners of ACP, ACP Architects Co-Partnership. They were like bookends. And I used to go to work on the bus with them every morning, and we'd come through uh, from Parliament Hill 
we come through Bedford Square. One travelled upstairs, the other travelled downstairs. I never quite discovered why. One got off in Bedford Square, the other got off the other side of Oxford Street. Now, Monica lived in the middle of this. And there were other people there. They were all the original ones. There was a diamond merchant from Hatton Garden. There was an LCC traffic planner who was asked um, one day by the powers that be at London County Council, would he do a feasibility study? So he said, yes. We want you to do it at home. Don't tell anybody about it at all. So they gave him these huge six-inch to the uh, mile ordnance survey maps, which he took home, unrolled on the carpet in the sitting room. His wife took one look at it and said, what's that? He said, oh, they want me to do a feasibility study for this road. This was at the beginning of the 60s. Where's it going? Well, it starts at the archway and it goes across to, um, uh, uh, to the roundhouse and then it goes from the roundhouse to John Barnes in Finchley Road and it's got to go through those three points but it can only deviate half a mile north and half a mile south. And she said, that's mad. And he said, yes, I know, but they want me to do a feasibility study. So the longest thing they had for uh, drawing a straight line was the handle of the U-Bank, which is, a, you know, those of us before electricity had those things. And uh, they unscrewed it, and he got his 10-year-old son, Peter, to draw straight lines and shade it all in beautifully with his pencils. And his wife typed out this totally spoof um, uh, account of this road. He took it in the, uh, the following week. The day they, they took it away from him, he didn't speak to anybody about it, and then um, he, he, somebody from the, GL, uh, the LCC came and said, tapped him on the shoulder, that was brilliant, the committee approved it. That was what became later known as the North Cross Route. Those of you who remember it, that crazy scheme to dig up half a pound did he. And Monica asked me to write an article about it, and that's how I entered into what is, I used to tell my students was created demolition. Now, also living in the close was Walter. He lived in a separate detached house. In the middle, those of you who remember, who've been there, there's a patch of grass and it had to be mowed by the members of the committee on rotation. The mower belonged to Walter and you pushed it along and it was about a foot wide. So the committee decided they would buy a petrol mower. Walter vetoed it. It was just like the United Nations and watching from my ground floor flat and, uh, you know, it, all, it was all rather amusing. And then Walter went away and they had an extraordinary meeting and bought a petrol mower. <laughs> so, one bank holiday, it was brought out and Michael Grice and Cook the Arbour can't remember which one of them started it up. And they started to push it. And suddenly, Walter's windows flew open. He leapt out in his short sandals with a ball of string, two wooden tent pegs, and a mallet like a vampire hunter. And he rushed up to this patch of grass, and he measured it, and he divided it an eighth off. Banged a peg in each end ran the piece of string, stood there like that, and dared anyone to come across it. So they didn't. And then he came out with his little mower 
and finished it off. Now, I said vampire hunters because at the time, John Winter, uh, round about that time, was thinking of, uh, is he here? Yeah, uh, yeah. John was, uh, you can, you can, uh, uh, I remember John telling me he parked his car up near Highgate Cemetery one day and there were all these strange people who tried to blow up Karl Marx and wandered about in the middle of the night dressed as vampires or vampire hunters with mallets and uh, wooden pegs and crosses and somebody put a corpse, a bandaged corpse, in John's car. Um, anyway, enough said. And uh, I mentioned um, Martin. Monica came to me one day and said, we've got this wonderful new writer. I said, who is it? It's called Rupert Spade. I said, you mean Martin Pawley. Don't tell anyone, she said. He works for the Architects Journal. Anyway, um, so that's how... She seemed to take waifs and strays. I don't know. Uh, she had this, this, I think, insight into people. And you know, both previous speakers, Ken and Michael, have said we... I think everyone here who knew Ma Monica owes a debt of gratitude to her. I was going to work one day and she just bought a new Mini and it was parked in the garages that Walter built that backed onto my garden that had a flat roof and he didn't believe in drain pipes, he believed in flat roofs and they're never flat because all the water used to pour off onto my garden and wash away the soil. But anyway, Monica, he didn't believe in doors for garages. So Monica said, as I was going to catch the bus, look at this. And I went and looked in the garage in the gloom, and there was her mini. And I thought, I said, it's a bit low, Monica. She said, they've stolen the wheels. <laughs> so people had come. Anyway, Monica used to hire us. She'd, working for AD, I don't know about the rest of you, taught me to draw in a particular way because all the drawings were done at ten and sixpence an hour. And, um, you know, you were given photo drawings or photographs and you traced them and you did them in a particular way. And one day, these drawings had come from Chicago, Mies van der Rohe. We need them redone. I said, you, we can't draw like that, Monica. So actually they did publish Mies's proper drawings. At the end of 1970, when this place was falling apart, um, Monica phoned me up. She said, I want you to meet Walter. Why? The pipes are leaking, she said. I said, what do you mean? Well, when St Anne's Close was built, it was in the days of building licences, and materials were hard to come by. Walter was incredibly resourceful, so was George Fairweather as well. They were forever doing things, and... Uh, Walter got all this, I think it was second-hand gas piping, and it was turned into water mains for the housing, and it ran along that sloping um, uh, bank, earth bank Well, it burst. And the water washed away, and there was danger, Monica said, of the whole lot of the back of St Anne's Close sliding into the front. So I had to meet Walter, outside here in January 71 on an absolutely freezing cold day. Walter turns up, open neck shirt and shorts, smoking <laughs> one of those dreadful cigars. And he says, I must have a pee. So we go downstairs to the loo. We're standing side by side as men do. And... Um, because women always think it's them that have all the fun in the toilets with all this conversation that goes on. Anyway, Walter said to me, I hate committees. 
I said, what do you mean, Walter? I only ever achieved something once on a committee. And I said, what was that? And he pointed up to the right, and they, there was a wooden shelf. And he said, I got that put in. <laughs> and I said, what is it for? I said, that's to put my drawings on when I come down here to have a pee. And unfortunately, I told Alvin about it, but he didn't believe me. And um, in one of Alvin's makeovers, it was taken away. Now, the one thing I always found her wonderful, maybe I had something you didn't have, I don't know, I was younger. Anyway, the one thing I feared, and I'm sure everybody else feared, was a call from Monica, you've got to come to the office now. So you didn't dare not go, so I would wander over from Camden where I worked, and... She would say, Peter, and Peter was in the corner with a pot of gloy and a piece of cardboard with beautifully ruled coloured lines on it with the galley proofs stuck on. And there they were, and then your article was sticking off the bottom like that. <laughs> and she said, you've got to cut 200 words off. <laughs> when? Now? I can't, Monica. So then she'd say, Peter, and Peter would go like that. <laughs> and Peter would cut it off slightly above the top, and then he'd cut the last sentence in your name and glue it on. Now, I have met people who read articles that we wrote in the 1960s when people who don't do it now but used to smoke funny substances and get up to strange things in the AA and um, uh, they would find them deeply meaningful. <laughs> but it was really, it was Peter and his pair of scissors. Anyway, I, I found Monica, Monica was delightful. She really was an incredible person, and I think we all of us owe a huge debt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, after Ken, uh, Robin Middleton uh, joined AD and was the technical editor for most of the 60s, and I joined Robin in the late 60s and stayed there till 1974. Um, the, uh, uh, Ken talked about running the magazine during the swinging 60s. I guess I was running it during the period of flower power, when things changed quite a lot. And... We must have been a lot slower at working than Ken because we had to start work at 11 o'clock in the morning. And, but we worked in the same office and uh, one of the things I remember distinctly about it was that uh, next to Monica's chair was a three-legged Jakobsen chair of the sort which is now illegal under health and safety <laughs> regulations. Um, and it, uh, frequently eminent uh, uh, architects would come into the room uh, keen to show Monica their work, they would lay it out on the table in front, lean forward to point something out to her and slip uh, gracelessly under the table. And uh, Monica always found this uh, rather amusing because I th she liked the idea, I think, of, of might say, pricking the bubbles of some of our more arrogant visitors, of which, of course, there were many. Um, in about 1970, the Architect Standard Catalogue Company, which was run by the Dotteridge family, the owners of the uh, Whitefriars Press. Um, the head of the family was uh, a chap called Basil Dotteridge, a gent in a fine suit with a fresh uh, flower buttonhole uh, every day and known uh, to all the staff, except the staff of AD, of course, um, all the staff in the Edwardian way of Mr. Basil. And uh, then uh, Mr. David, his son, turned up uh, to be the uh, business manager and uh, new uh, uh, e economic measures were put in place which meant that th the uh, substantial savings had to be made to the print budget. So we moved from 
the rather uh, cumbersome letterpress uh, uh, system of printing to uh, web offset, which was the sort of revolutionary thing then to print in, and also much more flexible uh, in the way that Sam has suggested. You could snip away at things uh, uh, as much as you liked, uh, scalpels and, uh, uh, and cow gum, actually, it, it was Sam we used. And... Uh, uh, Monica developed uh, in this uh, uh, changing economic situation, I mean, there was a sort of a bit of a recession, rather like now, um, what she called the book economy, which was uh, we didn't have to worry about advertising, we just had to cut our costs uh, so that our income uh, was enough from sales, was enough to cover the expenditure for running the, the whole office. It, it did prove very difficult, and uh, we did cut costs to the bone. But uh, it, did, it, it lasted for several years and, uh, uh, in fact, was then that whole economy was copied by uh, Papadakis uh, when uh, he was running the magazine as well. So it, it did work. Uh, Sam, uh, I think probably Sam, it, it, because you weren't a sort of full-time employee, you didn't see the full blast of Monica when she was unhappy. Um, she, Many, many times we, 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 we did quite often and, and she, w she, was, she was very strict with us and, uh, but we had many secretaries the secretaries came and went uh, with remarkable uh, rapidity uh, and they were frequently in tears and I was describing uh, the other day this we, we had a book where you had to fill in the, the main job the secretary had was every time uh, somebody sent in a bundle of photographs every photograph was given a number and the number was put into a book registered it came in and then when it was sent back it, it was filled in again and, and it, written out was written against it these books were stained with the tears of secretaries <laughs> who were weeping as uh, they'd just been uh, given some telling off by Monica but I did find actually that once I left employment, Monica was so much more relaxed and, uh, and friendly. So I think that, that's the answer to your uh, question. And like Ken, uh, she supported me hugely in the sort of things we are doing in the magazine. And uh, she supported me personally. And I, I remember one particular occasion when uh, I had laid out uh, an article of uh, a house designed by Erno Goldfinger and uh, got the scissors out again and, and actually it was a house called The Clouds. Peter Goldfinger might remember it but it was a timber house somewhere in Surrey I think and I cut all the pictures out in the shape of clouds and, and stuck it down. This he thought was a real insult to his architecture and he came <laughs> into, into the room thre threatening to horsewhip whoever it was who had actually done this job and those of you who knew uh, no, he was uh, one of the fiercer archi ar architects of his time, uh, probably a bit fiercer than Monica. And, uh, but I have to say, Monica stood up for me. She didn't tell Erno that he, I was the one responsible. I was cowering in the corner that uh, Sam described. And she stood up to him and sent him packing, not having horsewhipped anyone. So I, I guess that... Uh, you know, we, we all have some people whose influence on one's lives is immense. Godparents, teachers, tutors, that sort of thing. Uh, people whose decisions and advice alter the direction you take and the goals you seek. And uh, Monica certainly uh, did that for me. And I carried on working with her in slightly different capacity, really, uh, right up until shortly before she died. I uh, helped her edit the uh, Pigeon Digital, and Stephen Albert will talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. But uh, right to the end, uh, Monica was nagging me about producing more recordings and keeping to schedule, and uh, just uh, ten days before she died, I got a real telling off about the fact that we were running a bit behind schedule on the six new recordings that had to be delivered by the end of the year. Um, so I, uh, like the other speakers, owe Monica a huge uh, debt of gratitude and I'm very glad to see so many people here today who have come to pay their tributes. And uh, there will be a roving microphone later when we finish the more formal things. So if anyone does have a story they'd like to tell, please do think about it now and uh, maybe tell us uh, in a moment. Thank you.
Now, our, our next speaker is, uh, speaker is Barbara Goldstein, who uh, worked with Monica at AD and at the RIBA Journal and has flown all the way from California to be here tonight. Well, in the spirit of Monica's ability to edit things, I'm going to try to be a little bit brief here. My first contact with Monica Pigeon was as an architectural student at Rhode Island School of Design when in the United States. It was the mid-70s, and no one in my college was actually teaching architecture in a traditional way. We were learning how to think about architecture, not how to make it. We were exploring the possibilities of technology, temporary construction, and the nature of personal space. It was that time that I began reading Architectural Design Magazine and discovered an entirely new world, Archigram, the Metabolis, inflatable architecture, and even the idea of a long-distance love affair that you would have across the, the globe with somebody that you didn't even know through some mysterious technology, which we now know as the Internet. Monica, I thought, must be a young, swinging Lundi London dolly who wore a mini skirt and hung around with some very ingenious people. Imagine my surprise when I was introduced to Monica when I was a tutor at the Architectural Association, and she invited me to be an assistant editor to replace somebody who just wasn't working out. <laughs> I got the part about friendship with ingenious architects right, and probably the swinging part as well. What I didn't expect was someone whose experience was etched on her face and who had been publishing AD for 30 years. To my 23 years old, she seemed absolutely ancient. But she's the same age that I am now. <laughs> Mona, of, Monica, of course, was not ancient, and working for her was my graduate school education. In fact, it was my real architectural education. Monica's enthusiasm and knowledge about architecture were contagious and her generosity towards me as an inexperienced young person was life-changing. She took me with her when she interviewed people like Ovi Arup, Cedric Price, Richard Rogers, John Turner, Norman Foster, and many, many more. I accompanied her to see the construction of the Centre Pompidou and IRCAM under construction, and we went to see buildings in the United States, and we interviewed architects in New York, Philadelphia, Houston, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles. My eyes were open, and I learned more about architecture and urban design all the time that I worked with her. Monica was also very generous to me as a human being, giving me her old hand-me-down jacket one winter when I was too impoverished to buy one of my own, sharing her life experience with me and providing me with an example of what a truly independent woman was like. She was direct, sometimes painfully so, <laughs> energetic, open-minded, and passionate. In fact, if I were to imagine a biography of Monica Pigeon, I would call it Architects That I've Known and Loved. Because not only was she enthusiastic about architecture, she loved architects as well. When an architect came to visit and share his work, and it was always a man, um, there weren't too many women architects in those days. If Monica was drawn to him and his story, she became a real loyal supporter. That's not to say that she didn't have great judgment about architecture but that she related to architects on a very personal level, as well as a professional one. This showed in her attitude towards publishing architects' work. She never really wanted to critique the work of architects that she knew well. She preferred to let them speak in their own words, sometimes ad nauseum, I should add. Um, I learned this personally um, very early on when she asked me to write a short article about Lawrence Halperin and his take part workshops in San Francisco. When I attempted to analyze his practice critically from the perspective of the participants, she rejected the article and invited Larry to write it himself. <laughs> and yet Monica's trust in architects, her instinct for new ideas, and her talent for spotting strong technical editors and, and writers was absolutely on target. Architectural design moved with the times. It was a publication of record of the modern movement in the 40s to the early 60s, and morphed into a magazine of emerging ideas in the late 60s and 70s, promoting ideas that were ahead of their time during the time that she edited it. Monica's passions, especially during the last 15 years of her time at architectural design, were alternative energy, housing, and new technologies. She promoted John Turner's work with favelas, Martin Pauli's garbage housing work, 
Alexander Pike self-sufficient house, Fry Otto suspended structures, and Cedric Price's mutable architecture. All of these are as pertinent today as they were then, only today we can realize them because we have the technology. It's interesting when you think about it. Although I joined Monica at the RIBA Journal and the job supported us both to continue to work as a team and to meet more architects, see new buildings and places and travel, it was never as much fun as working at AD. These are a few things that I learned from Monica. Let architects speak for themselves. If you don't like something, don't publish it. If you can't remember somebody's name, just use the term of endearment. The one that she usually used was Ducky. It's okay to be direct or even argue strongly about something, just don't hold a grudge. Although Monica may not have been a model mother to her own children, she was a role model for me. I would never have accomplished my work as editor and publisher of, Ar publisher of Arts and Architecture magazine, my writing for architectural magazines, or directing public art programs in Seattle and San Jose if it hadn't been for her encouragement and example. As an employer, she alternated between being a mother figure and a martinet. As a human being, she was a loyal ally and a formidable opponent. She was both mercurial and inspiring. For the last month, I found myself thinking, I can't wait to visit London to share this new idea or accomplishment with Monica. Then I had to pull myself back because I realized that I was coming to her memorial service. I can't believe that she's gone and I will miss her immensely. Next is, is Stephen Albert, who worked on uh, Monica's audiovisual program and now uh, Pigeon Digital. Stephen. Uh, I must admit to feeling somewhat intimidated, uh, as I don't have an architectural background at all. However, here goes. <coughs> I worked with Monica on the Pigeon Digital archive for many years, right up to the end of her life and want to pay tribute in particular to her indomitable spirit and formidable intellect. Her spirit was especially evident in her later years, when in 2003 it became evident that the method of delivering the talks as tape slide packs had become outmoded. She continued, even in her 90th year, to give critical attention to every aspect of the change to digital delivery. As for her formidable intellect, I first met her some 30 years ago when she had already recorded several talks. She had established a methodology that worked but always depended on the quality of what she could deliver. And that was what I found most remarkable, her absolute commitment to excellence in every aspect of what she wanted to put out. She had a tireless energy in pursuing anyone she thought would be an asset to the archive to record a talk and often went back after several years to the same person when she thought they had something new to contribute. She considered it essential to cover every aspect of architecture and related art de and design including landscape architects such as Geoffrey Jellicoe and Catherine Gustafsson, engineers like Conrad Wachsmann and Ted Happold, interior design, Eva Jerichner, history, a mini-series on, on Lutyens with, for example, Gavin Stamp, design with speakers such as Alan Fletcher and Ettore Sotsas. She was often ahead of her time on subjects such as climate change, covered in a 1980 talk by Charles Correa, energy conservation discussed by Max Fordham, self-build to which Walter Siegel contributed, and conservation, which was a particular hobby horse of hers, with speakers such as Trevor Danat and Paolo Portoghese. Also, she was especially keen to ensure an international flavor to the series, traveling to America, Australia, Europe, etc., even when she was in her 70s. Thus, the real tribute to a moniker is in the quality of the talk she has left in this archive. And I feel honored to have worked with her for so many years, a period in which generally I saw her maybe once a month or even more and found her entirely charming 
and hospitable. In her latter years, she showed a great love of her family with an often changing board of extended family photos on the wall beside her. And she also took an interest in my family, which I found very remarkable. Finally, I must mention about this remarkable lady that I last saw her about 10 days before she died. Though initially she was a little down because of difficulties with eyesight and walking, she soon perked up to discuss the new talks being prepared by Peter Murray. And our final words were, see you in a couple of weeks or so. Yes, looking forward to it. I shall indeed miss her. And now Victoria Thornton. Uh, thank you. Um, I always feel when I was talking to friends at the, um, at the funeral that uh, there were lots of new friends, old friends in the um, chapel. Uh, but I actually knew Monica when she was becoming a pensioner, in fact, when she was about 65. And there was over 40 years difference uh, in age, but it didn't seem to matter with Monica because she always liked something modern. She wanted to know what was happening contemporary. So being a younger thing, I was sort of in the right uh, groove. And I was a female, not a male, which was a bit unusual in that way. But um, I actually first came across Monica uh, when I was a young pup at the RIBA. Um, and I didn't hear she was rather fearsome upstairs with Barbara, but it was somewhere else in the building. Um, and we had a conference in Hull, and years later she said, well, you, you know you were wearing this dress, this kind of candy floss rainbow dress. And I said, well, was I? She said, well, yes, you know, it was, and she described it intimately. And that was about Monica. She knew about, uh, always think about detail. And it herself was so elegant, but she always recognized in others, and she was always picking up on these things. So Monica's, uh, my life actually came together a bit more because about five years later, I set up architectural study tours, architecture tours. And of course, Monica was my first, one of my first um, groupies, as it were. And uh, we would go all over the world. And of course, in Monica's way, she would tell me where we should be going. Um, and uh, whether that was good enough. And of course, always telling me the price was too much and uh, single room supplement and why did I have this? So um, Monica in her, might have not been with the magazines any longer, but she was telling me exactly what, how I should be running uh, the tours. And going along with Monica and the tours, um, she would often say, um, just uh, knock on that door. And you go, but... Uh, you know, it's a nice building, but, you know, the owner's in there. She said, oh, I'm sure they'd be fine. I'm, just knock on the door. And you would knock on the door. And she said, I interviewed them 25, 30 years ago. And you go, oh, God, here we go again. And uh, open the door, and they would say, yes, I remember that. Come in, have a chat, have a cup of coffee. Except there were 30 others of us behind her. So she was a great way of entering uh, these buildings. Otherwise, <laughs> me as a young um, organizer, couldn't manage uh, myself. And another time we went to uh, look at Mario Botta's work and uh, we gave him, we went to his office. And it was, oh yes, a group of architects, that's very nice, but I see them every day. And Monica again said, uh, just tell him I'm here. And I go, okay, fine, we go again, we'll tell Monica. Next minute, Mario Botta was out of his office, into the hallway, and I would say virtually on his knees saying he was just so, so delighted to see her and remembered and she made such an impact on his life. And this is really how Monica worked. She worked so intimately with people. She actually engaged with them and she, as someone said earlier, uh, she respected them. And so you got this um, warmth back um, and maybe Mario Botta, for instance, didn't dare not turn up as well, so maybe it continued. But of course then uh, my life, was, again, I'm a sort of post-modern uh, friend of Monica's and best, best way of describing it. Um, we had a party, um, I was think 40, she was 80 plus, 
And it was, well, we'll do a joint party. It's good for business, she said. So here was pigeon uh, visual. So we had a party in um, our house, our home. And everybody turned up. I was thinking, oh, God, you know, who am I going to get then? So no, 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 don't worry, Victoria. There's going to be loads of people coming. They will definitely come. And we had a fantastic party. And I suppose that was part of my friendship with Monica. Because, of course, not only with the tour, she did live across the road from where um, I still live. And so I knew I could trot over there every so often. But the one thing I never did was trot over when I was feeling down or depressed because Monica didn't want me to moan. You would always feel that was not why you went to see Monica. She went there to make you think forward, to be positive. And so to have a moan, it was not the right place to go. But she was always incredibly um, welcoming. And as someone said, uh, there'd always be a coffee, tea, or if she knew it was about six o'clock, she said, what about a glass of wine for you? Because um, she was never really taking it herself. But then, um, as this friendship has grown over the time, of course, um, I set up Open House, as many of you know, uh, which is now in 17th year. And again, Monica was an avid um, person uh, coming to that and give me her list of what should be in it. And it was, um, again, saying, well, just knock on their door, basically. But of course, the one thing she did also, which was uh, a bit naughty of Monica, and I see um, Bide in Francesca and Alice here, is that um, she knew we had a system. We're very democratic about the weekend. There's no VIPs. You cannot jump queues unless you work. And so if you did some work in volunteering for four hours' time, uh, helping others to enjoy the weekend, you could get a badge, which allowed you to jump queues. Except Monica decided she didn't need to, jump, uh, to do the volunteering. She would just jump the queue. Well, I suppose in all the time, and I have to admit that I've never uh, really said to anybody else, yes, okay, I'll give you a badge, but please don't tell anybody else. But I didn't say, dare say no to her. So for me, she's um, always been there for me. Um, and I think Barbara said um, that she was really like a mentor. And she was for me. Um, taking all the way through. It's quite hard, obviously, setting up your own uh, business when you were 27 and having all these incredible architects, uh, much younger at that time, as we all were, um, coming on these tours. Um, Monica would give you that um, positiveness and, um, in a way, give you the dynamism towards you, yourself, to allow you to actually take this uh, group and engage in architecture. Uh, which sometimes was uh, not always the easiest thing to do when, as I say, I had this formidable group around me. But on a personal side, it's always sad to feel that she's not there. I always felt she would be across the road. She'd never not be. Um, but she had other things apart from architecture. She did her bridge on Friday afternoon. And um, Annabelle and Carl were saying actually about music, that she used to always play the, uh, a piano and they used to sing around the piano and actually do this uh, type of thing with uh, washing up as well. And this always seems a strange thing. Monica was always sort of dynamic, but actually she enjoyed life. And I think that was really that came through in her work, but also with her personal home and her friendship with all of us. So to say, I will miss her like everybody here, but I know what she would like is us moving forward, thinking positively and in a contemporary way, because uh, I never heard her talk backwards, as always forwards. And um, I'm sure she'll be smiling down on us, uh, hearing us all talking about her this evening. So thank you. Uh, Richard Rogers and Norman Foster weren't able to make it tonight, but they have recorded uh, a couple of uh, films for you to see now. <coughs> Monica, for me, was, amongst other things, but for quite a period of time, was architectural design. And architectural design in its heyday. Uncompromising, tough, revealing, um, and... Um, and wonderfully promotional of the work of young, unknown uh, architects. And I think we fitted into that category. And the, I remember the project awards um, 
uh, which had extraordinary mixture of curiosity, attraction, gravitas. Um, so for me, Monica, before I got to know her, was architectural design. And, and then uh, with Lenny Cohen, uh, the extraordinary archive of uh, recording for posterity the thoughts, the words, the attitudes, the philosophies of the most important people um, at the cutting edge of, uh, of architecture, whether they were young, whether they were established, uh, extraordinary architect. As a person, she was a, a, a kind of incredible force um, and, and, and really this kind of personality, her ability to really pin you down, I think uh, that was the continuous thread that linked together that later part of her life and the earlier part which, through my recall, was the extraordinary publications. I think that, that Monica achieved what she achieved because she was really a very genuine person. Uh, she could, I think, be quite frightening on first meeting. I mean, very uncompromising and wonderfully capable of extracting really what she wanted by way uh, of whether that was the insight for, uh, for a crit or whether it was to record uh, some thoughts, uh, reflections for, for posterity. Um, this I think was her clue. It's an extraordinary kind of uh, scholarly integrity um, but with the force of a personality to really uh, get things done. Monica entered my life as a breath of fresh air. She produced a completely different way of looking at magazines and in that way and also architecture. I remember well being introduced to Monica and in fact to Jim Richards, the other great editor of that time, Architectural Review. And they couldn't be more different. Jim was probably the doyen of magazines, beautifully worked out, beautifully laid history. Monica was dynamic and modern. When Thea Crosby came to be her editor, and I must have been, I guess, in my probably second year at that time when I met her at the Architecture Association, the two of them caught up with modernity. The magazine turned into a much more sort of homemade, very much like the earth catalogues of those days, written on what today would be called sort of throwaway paper. Um, rough print, rough paper, fantastic art articles, great buildings. She mixed with all the people of that time, CIM, uh, the uh, Team 10, um, the International Architectural Groupies, all came to see her, and she published them. I remember being introduced again through Monica to Buckminster Fuller, and Buckminster Fuller has continued to uh, affect my life and, and, uh, and my work. So Monica, both directly and indirectly, was not only just a catalyst, but she was actually in many ways a, t a teacher. Later on she had Ken Frampton, again, a, a real intellectual, Different in many ways to Thea Crosby, but he continued that tradition. I remember going to her office and uh, sitting down on the wobbly chairs. Uh, and later on, when we won Pompidou, the Pompidou, or the Boburger, it was then called competition, she gave us her full backing when everybody was attacking us. She used to invite me up to her house, uh, and we would have a few drinks. Uh, she'd be often be in her garden, I remember, and. She was a, a wonderfully warm person, probably her South American background helped her to be more approachable than many English people were at that time. She certainly broke the mold and I think we will remember her as being probably the most important editor of an architectural ma magazine at what could be considered the most innovative time of um, uh, British architecture in the 50s and 60s and 70s. She continued, as far as I can remember, she her, well, her, certainly her interest continued right to the end with her, with her interviews, her films, 
Um, and you could always exchange ideas. You could always expect to have a, a good talk with Monica. And I will miss her greatly. I went to her 90th birthday party, and I think that was probably the last time I saw her. I, I will join everybody who remembers her in saying she was a really great person. Uh, we did have Ed Jones earlier on the programme, but he has now managed to get here from Luton. Uh, 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 Ed Jones. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I've never come down the M1 so, so fast uh, to be here this evening. So if I start shaking a lot at the rostrum, you'll, you'll know it's the motorway that got to me. Um, uh, delighted to be here, and... Um, I want to say uh, that I was one of Monica's boys. Uh, this is not in the literal sense or in any, or in any other sense, but for 50 years she was a, a sort of constant presence in my architectural life. As a student at the A in the late 1950s, architectural design was really it. It, it was the best. It was uh, <coughs> directed by Monica. Theo was there at the start, but Kenneth... Frampton was very influential, followed by Robin, Robin Middleton. We were introduced to Tarani, we were introduced to uh, the futurists that Gideon and Pevsner didn't have in the reading list. We didn't read about the futurists. Kenneth, that's correct, yes? I mean, G Gideon just bypassed them. But, well, well, no, Bannum, Bannum was, in, was important, but he wasn't running the magazine. Uh, uh, so, um, and Baum and Wern and um, architecture aujourd'hui were kind of comrade spirits, and British magazines, as they were then, the review, the AJ, were quite provincial. Um, through Mon Monica's influence, we had Peter Smithson's amazing uh, essays, Ruminations, particularly the one on Eames comes to mind, an extraordinary essay, um, comparing cubism and the bicycle with um, the plastic forming of those chairs and rocket science. It, it, it was an extraordinary essay. It doesn't come very particularly in its detail to mind. And the most important one I thought, which I saw on the screen just as I came in, was the heroic period of modern architecture, uh, curated by the Smithsons and... Chris, Chris Woodward, with that extraordinary picture of Mies and Korb walking in animated conversation on the, on the cover. So important moments for us as students. Ken Frampton, Alan Cahoon, Bob Maxwell, and Neve Brown, amongst others, contributed really excellent essays. I mean, the best, I think, architectural criticism one could have had um, as, a, as a student to read, and somehow in the following decade, that coterie got up and emigrated to the USA. We, we just lost them in that decade. As a young assistant in Douglas Stevens' office in the early 60s, Monica would send me out with others as a kind of hired gun. We'd go to other offices and draw their buildings up. Owen Luder's parking ga garage in Portsmouth comes to mind as something one, one, one drew up. I saw it being knocked down the other, the other day. Um, but the most memorable one was going to Gloucester Place to draw for Sterling and Gowan, the um, Leicester en Engineering Building that I remember Kenneth did a very good cover for AD at the time, which was the Vitruvius figure in silver. And that remains a kind of icon that one can't quite forget. Um, this is not to say this, this, uh, moon, this moonlighting was a result of Douglas not paying us sufficiently well, but um, uh, no, no, Douglas wasn't tight. He was a generous per person. Um, the following decade, Monica um, kind of, good heavens, there she is, um, looking, looking after us as young architects, um, particularly Jeremy Dixon, Chris Cross, Mike Gold, and myself, she published us quite early, uh, and she was always some, somehow there 
for us. We were given a most unlikely name of the Grunt Group, which was published in um, AD, AD, and I think about 1973, um, with Robin Middleton's editorship. This is getting slightly autobiographical. Um, that we, this, this title was coined by Peter Cook. Later on, Pigeon's audiovisual in the 1990s, in conversations with Jeremy and myself in the, about the regrettably unbuilt Venice bus station, and always conversations with Monica at the front of an occasion like this. She should always be sitting there. Um, and sadly, she's not with us this evening. Um, and so fast forward to a spring morning in Highgate um, earlier this year with Chris Woodward, and we dropped in un uninvited at St. Anne's Close to take a photograph of Monica, no, no, of, of Monica's house, <laughs> uh, which Monica lived in, um, the quiet domestic architecture of Walter Siegel um, for our forthcoming revised book. Uh, Monica was gardening um, and greeted us with all her customary bonhomie, um, saying how happy she was that Walter would be somehow remembered. Um, <laughs> I, I mentioned this to Christopher, and he reminded me that Monica was also attended by a particularly attractive bare-chested Polish gardener who was looking after her, it seems. She wished us well and looked forward to seeing the updated edition of our book. Uh, it came out last month, and I trust that Monica would have approved of our entry. And so, in closing, for me, Monica joins that special group of individuals who arrived somehow from nowhere or from somewhere else. Somewhere else seems to be quite important for those who come and make contributions in this city. Um, in this pantheon, I would include, amongst others, historians Pevsner, Middleton, Rasmussen, the publishers Papadakis, Boyarski, the theorists Creer, Coolhouse, and Jenks, and that marvelous group of women, um, Rita Wolf, um, Zoe Zen Galitz, and Madeleine Weisenthrop, who drew up their partner's work, and Monica herself. She came from somewhere else, and uh, I guess is in our hearts today. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, that, that's the sort of last of the uh, formal presentation. I don't know if there is anyone who would like to uh, make a brief contribution before we go upstairs for a drink or whether you just want to talk upstairs. <laughs> no? Well, we'll be going up to the library in a minute. I, I've just got uh, two or three brief um, comments uh, have been sent for this evening, people who couldn't come here. Uh, Bernard Toomey uh, has written... Monica Pigeon had an incredible dedication to architecture and a specific attention to the intentions of architects that was always evident in her interviews. I knew her from her days at architectural design. She was amusingly weary of all architectural theory, which she called mumbo-jumbo, and yet she was very supportive of new ideas and of the younger generation. She is sadly missed as a unique, constant, un unquenchable voice. Uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi wrote, her unique and early audio documentation of architecture and architects has been highly important to our profession. We were flattered and encouraged that she found our ideas worthy of inclusion and we enjoyed the conviviality of her visits to our office to record interviews. She was a charming and accomplished colleague and we shall miss her companionship. It seems fitting that her legacy endures through Pigeon Digital. We wish continued accomplishment um, compliment, sorry, pardon me, to her successors. Um, Daniel Liebeskind. Uh, Monica Pigeon was one of the great forces in understanding, documenting, and promoting contemporary architecture. She was a free spirit with an independent mind and a vision that was always open to the future. We will all miss her passion and dedication to the spirit of architecture. Uh, 
I'm very glad we could hold this here today. I think the AA was, was a very important place for Monica. And, uh, while I was at AD, it was when a, a, the AA was going through very difficult times, and uh, uh, we supported it hugely, and uh, I'm sure she would have loved to have been here. She always loved a party, and uh, so we'll go upstairs and enjoy ourselves. So thank you very much for coming, and see you in the library. <laughs>